Today we continue our message series about the seven marks of a disciple. There are seven times when Jesus uh, in the gospel said, these are the conditions or the characteristics I need to see if you're going to be my disciple. We've been walking through these seven characteristics. So let me invite you to take the listening guide that you found hopefully in the proclaimer as you picked it up or as one was given to you. And today we're looking at number five of our list, which was that characteristic that followers of Jesus are the ones who are obeying Jesus. And we return to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where Jesus gives those, those three phrases that he often put together, that of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. In Luke chapter 9, it says that he said to them all, to all those who are listening, if anyone desires to come after me, let him, and here's that triplet, deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, Jesus said this on multiple occasions, no less than five times do the Gospels record him saying almost the identical thing. So this must have been important to him. And we've been taking each of these apart. They formed our different parts of these marks, uh, denying yourself and then surrendering everything. And today, what did he mean by that final part of this phrase, follow me? He said that so often. And how is it that following him means that we are to obey him. One of the most common things Jesus told his followers was, come follow me. Time and time again in the scriptures, it said they followed him. He said, follow me. Indeed, those of you involved in our church-wide prayer triplet process, on the cover of your prayer booklet has the phrase, following Jesus. So Jesus always was talking about following him. It was a common phrase. But what does it mean for your life in the year 2019 whether you're a senior adult, a high school student, a mom or dad, what does it mean today for you to follow Jesus? Now, you need to understand the cultural context when Jesus was raising up these disciples. Jesus was raised in a Jewish environment. All of his disciples were Jewish men, and Jesus was often seen as a rabbi. Indeed, many times didn't they address him as rabbi. Rabbi, teach me this. Rabbi, what about this? And Jesus' teaching style mimic that of a rabbi. People would ask questions, and he would often ask a question to return. It was question for question. That was a very common technique for rabbis, answering questions with another question. And so Jesus is trying to teach them in that cultural context, and so he says, follow me. And when people followed a rabbi, that means they submitted themselves to the rabbi's teachings, his interpretations, and to his authority. And when Jesus said, follow me, that means submit to me. In, in common terms, Jesus would say, do what I tell you to do. <laughs> so following him meant to obey him. The disciples of the gospel period could not say they were following Jesus if they were not obeying him. And people today cannot say they're following Jesus if they are not submitting to his rule his authority in their lives. We show we're following Jesus when we are obeying Jesus. See, the mark, the truest mark of following Jesus is not that you come to church on Sunday, although I believe coming to church on Sunday is good. But I'm here to guarantee you, I've been at this 35 years, and there are plenty of people that sit in the pews in church on Sunday, and they're not following Jesus. Following Jesus isn't just memorize some Bible verses. How many people could answer Bible trivia questions, but they're still not following Jesus? How many people think following Jesus is just thinking happy thoughts and living a good life? But Jesus said, it means to obey me. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, Jesus said. Take up the cross and then follow me. Submit to my teachings. Submit to my authority. And we do that when we are obeying him. You get a sense of that when Matthew quotes Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew was the most uh, Jewish of all the four Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one of the reasons some people say Matthew comes first in the order is his Gospel has the most Jewish flavor, and maybe it's a natural bridge from the Old Testament then to the New Testament. But in Matthew chapter 11, he quotes Jesus as saying to his disciples, you see it on your listening guide, come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And then he makes this interesting phrase. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
Now, what in the world, <laughs> what in the world was Jesus talking about when he said, take my yoke upon me? You see, in the, in the rabbinical circles of, of ancient Judaism, a disciple would have his, I mean, a, a rabbi would have his view of certain interpretations. Even today, if you're to visit the Holy Land, certain Jewish people wear a certain type of clothing, certain type of hats, they wear a certain type of sideburns because they're under the tutelage of a rabbi and they're following his instructions, they're following his yoke, his group of teachings. But Jesus said, are you weary of all the rules and regulations? Are you heavy laden? You're tired of trying to cross every T and dot every I? Are you tired of the heaviness of religion? Well, then take my yoke upon you. Follow my teachings for my yoke. It's not a bunch of rules and regulations. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden Following me won't burden your soul with a bunch of do's and don'ts. My yoke is easy and, and my burden upon you, if you'll follow me, is light. So Jesus is calling them to follow them like people would follow a rabbi, to submit to his teachings, his authority, and his rule over their daily lives. It means we must obey Jesus. In the year 2019, if John Waters is a disciple of Jesus, that means I need to be obeying Jesus to submit to his rule and authority over my life. Let me walk you through five observations about obedience that ought to be reflected in our lives if we indeed are truly following Jesus. The first observation is that obedience demonstrates lordship. You know who's the Lord of your life by what you obey. And our obedience is a reflection of of the lordship of Jesus, that we have bent our will to his. We have submitted to his authority that I'm not in charge of my life, you're not in charge of your life, that we have surrendered our life to Jesus. That's the reason he often puts this phrase of following me as a part of that triplet. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and then you can follow me. Because if you don't deny yourself, and you don't take up your cross, don't kid yourself. You won't be able to obey me and follow me. The first two are, lead, are leading their own ramps to the third one. Once you have said no to yourself, once you've taken up your cross, surrendered everything, then you're ready, in today's world especially, then you're ready to obey Jesus and to follow him. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, I believe, uh, Jesus asked a haunting question. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? But do not do the things which I say. And that question echoes across the ages through God's word. It, 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 it pierces our heart. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? And you don't even do what I say. <laughs> because if I am your Lord, if I am your master, not just your rabbi, if I am the creator of the universe, master and king and savior of your life, why do you call me Lord? But you don't do what I say. You're living your life <laughs> instead of living the life I've called you to lead. And ultimately, obedience is to Jesus. We don't follow a set of teachings. We aren't following a, a worldview of philosophy or religion. We, we don't follow doctrine. We follow a person. And that person is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross as a substitute for my sins and for your sins. He was raised from the dead, and that you can have peace in life if you'll believe in him. So following Jesus means we follow him, and we obey him. So observation number one is that obedience demonstrates the lordship of Jesus in our lives. The second observation is that obedience cannot be partial or delayed. If your obedience is partial obedience, or you hadn't gotten around to it yet, even though you mean to, those are just different terms for disobedience. <laughs> In other words, obedience must be fast and full. It cannot be partial. It cannot be delayed. You either obey him now or you disobey him now. You either obey him all the way or you've disobeyed him all the way. Sometimes, though, as I say, we're in church, so let's be honest, okay? <laughs> Sometimes we're mighty proud of our partial disobedience, especially when we can point out so many other people who haven't done anything at all. But, but Lord, we've been, look, look how much more we have done, Lord. And the Lord says, you haven't done all I've asked you to do. But we're excited about partial obedience 
And we think somehow that satisfies the one we call Lord and Savior. In the scriptures, time and time again, when, when people followed Jesus, it was an immediate response. They immediately left. They immediately obeyed. The disciples immediately left their, their nets. Zacchaeus immediately came down from the tree. Ananias in Acts chapter 9 immediately went to the street called Straight. People immediately followed him or they didn't follow at all. Do you all remember the story of the man that came to Jesus and said, I'd like to be your follower. And Jesus said, well, good. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> That's the John Waters version, okay? And, and this man said, well, first let me go bury my father. And once I've buried my father, then I'll follow you. And Jesus said, I'm not going to have it. Let the dead bury the dead. Once a man puts his hand to the plow, he can't look back. Now, often that story disturbs us because it sounds like this poor fella, his dad has just died, and Jesus said, well, don't worry about your dead dad. You come and follow me. Just leave him alone. That, that's not the context of the story. Most Bible students and scholars would say what the man was saying is, my, my father's not dead and buried yet, so give me five or ten years, and once in ten years my dad has died and family obligations are over, sometime then I'll come follow you. And Jesus said, no, you follow me now or don't follow me at all. It wasn't that the man's dad had just died that morning and Jesus said, leave him aside. This man was trying to say, well, I want to follow you, but i got some other things I need to take care of first, and maybe five years or ten years from now, I'll follow him, just like people do today. How many people today say, well, once I get the kids out of the house, then I'm going to do something for the Lord? Hello. Once I get a new job that pays a little better, and then I'm going to do what I need to do for the Lord. Once I take care of this and once I take care of that. But Jesus says, follow me now. If you don't follow me now, then why will you follow me then? One of my disciplines is to read a lot of the Puritan writings. And one of the most prolific Puritan writers was Thomas Fuller, an English pastor. And one of his writings, he said, you cannot obey too soon because you do not know how soon it would be too late. <laughs> I think he's right. Is there something in your life where you have partially obeyed God? Or maybe something you're, you're meaning to get to, you, you, you just haven't gotten to it yet, but one of these days you're going to get to it? <laughs> Obedience cannot be partial. It cannot be delayed. You either obey him now or you disobey him now. A third observation about obedience is that it fosters spiritual growth. If you want to grow closer to Jesus, you simply have to obey him. Uh, I, I've said before, you, you can't make a cake using salt instead of sugar. You know, it's just not going to work. <laughs> and you can't live a godly Christian life if you're not obeying the Lord. Somehow in our Western version of Christianity, we, we've gotten to the point where we think, as long as I come to church on Sunday, if not every week, at least every couple of weeks, as long as I come to church on Sunday, then I'm obeying the Lord Jesus. And He doesn't care what I do on Saturday or what I do on Tuesday or what I do with every other part of my life. And, and we bought into that misunderstanding and it's hindered our spiritual growth. But you simply will not grow closer to Jesus if there are those pockets of disobedience that you keep tucked away. If there's unconfessed sin, if there's an ungodly lifestyle, if you're a Sunday morning believer only and not a Friday night follower of Jesus, you simply will not grow closer to Jesus. Obedience is what fosters and fuels your spiritual growth. So if you're not growing in your spiritual life, is there some place where you're not obeying him in your spiritual life? Now, that doesn't mean you've gotten out drunk on Friday night and you're living like a hellion and you're just raising cane everywhere. But maybe you're just disobedient in your Bible reading. You're disobedient to serve the poor. You hold on to feelings of bitterness or racism or greed. Those things will hinder your spiritual growth. But when you obey him in all things, that is the fuel that fosters your spiritual growth. Obedience fosters your spiritual growth. So if you're not growing, is there something in your life 
where you're not obeying him. The fourth observation about obedience uh, is that obedience produces joy. In your life, it, it bubbles out when you're obeying and following him. Now, I don't know where we got this idea that obeying Jesus is drudgery. Oh, I can't ever have any fun. You know, doom and gloom. It's like those soldiers on the Wizard of Oz, you know, oh, Dio, oh, God, obey, no fun. Now, don't pretend like you haven't seen that movie. And those flying monkeys, and that's the scariest thing I've ever seen. You know, just drudgery, no fun. Look at, all, look at all the unbelievers out there. They're having all the fun, and we're over here, drudgery, having to obey Jesus. That is a lie. I've been pastoring since I was 19 years old. I've seen people who were broken and empty and bitter. I've seen people who were full of joy and contentment. And you know what usually the difference is? Some people had their lives filled with sin and disobedience. Others lived a godly life unto the Lord. And when you live a life of obedience, that's where joy, that's where peace, that's where contentment comes. Following Jesus is not drudgery. That's the pathway to rejoicing and fulfillment. Catherine Marshall was the uh, widow of the uh, great preacher Peter Marshall. And she said, from where comes this idea that if what we are doing is fun, it can't be God's will? <laughs> the God who made giraffes, a baby's fingernails, a puppy's tail, and a young girl's giggle has a sense of humor. Make no mistake about that. As Billy Graham uh, used to say, you don't think God has a sense of humor? Look at the person seated next to you. <laughs> There's joy in following the Lord. We, we just finished a church-wide study on spiritual gifts. Many of you participated. If not, it's not too late. We can give you uh, some of the information, how you can help identify your spiritual gifts. And right now, your leadership staff is working on putting together what we call a ministry match list. And so that whatever your spiritual gift is, we're going to show you places within the body of Christ, the church, where you can serve. And so, if, say, if, you're, if your spiritual gift came out to be um, uh, serving or helping, well, we're going to show you, here's all the places where you can use your ministry of help or your ministry of mercy. Maybe your spiritual gift is administration. Well, here's a ministry match list, all the ways you can plug in if that's your gift. So, we're, we're compiling that now so you know how to use it. But, but one of the ways you know you're using your spiritual gift is that you find a sense of joy in what you're doing. You find your sweet spot. That if you're, if you're serving the Lord somehow and it's just laborious and just full of doom and just drudgery, that's not your spiritual gift. Because <laughs> when you serve according to your giftedness, it's sweet. <laughs> you're in the zone. <laughs> you were made for that and there's joy from it. So if what you're doing for the Lord causes you drudgery, don't do it. Because apparently God's got something else he wants you to do. When you serve where the Lord's called you to serve, there's contentment and peace and joy. That's what obedience brings. And the fifth observation of obedience is that it always becomes visible. Obedience, sooner or later, will always become visible. The Apostle John talked about that in his book of 1 John near the end of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 2 now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. In other words, in Statesboro, Georgia, southeast, Bullock, southeast Georgia, and the Bullock County region, if you're a follower of Jesus, your life should show it. People should see it. Your faith is very personal extremely personal, but it is not private. No matter where you are, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what your workplace, the fact that you're a follower of Jesus, people ought to see it. People ought to know it. It ought to be visible because it just leaks out everywhere. You can't keep it hidden because following Jesus makes a difference 
in everything that you do. Well, let me finish with a couple of personal application questions about my life and about your life. If we're obeying and following Jesus. Question number one is, um, am I learning from Jesus? See, one of the marks of a disciple is you're learning. You're, you, it's like ingesting. You're taking it in primarily through reading the Scriptures and the relationships of other believers. Are, are you learning from Jesus? Remember, it was that, that model of a rabbi teaching. We're under his tutelage. We're, we're receiving from him. We're learning from him. Are you reading and learning from Jesus? And then second, are you living for Jesus? One is the internal. The other is the external. One you bring in, the other you're living out. And that's the definition of a disciple. Somebody who's learning from Jesus and also living for Jesus. The things you may do in private, but it's going to be seen in public. When you're learning from Jesus and living for Jesus, that's what it means to follow Jesus. And when you are following and obeying Jesus, he's going to take you some places. So let me tell you where your faith will take you if you indeed obey Jesus and do what it tells you to do and you go where he wants you to go, and you do what he wants you to do. First, Jesus will take you to some difficult places. Don't think for a moment that following Jesus is just a walk in the park. <laughs> Sometimes the Lord calls you to, to do some of the most difficult things you've ever had to do. And he sustains you, and he empowers you. But following Jesus and obeying the commands of the Lord can be difficult. Do you all remember the story from uh, the book of Daniel of the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember King Nebuchadnezzar built this big old golden statue and said everybody needs to bow down. And those three boys said, we're not going to do it because we, we bow down only to the Almighty God. And the king said, well, I got this fiery furnace and I'm going to throw you in this furnace and you're going to burn alive. Unless you bow down. And the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, said, King, we don't know if God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, let it be known today that we will not bow down to you even if we're thrown in the fiery furnace. You think that was easy for those three possibly 18, 19, 22, 23-year-olds? Was it easy to stay? It, it wasn't easy for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stare down King Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't easy for Abraham to take his only son Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him in obedience to God. It wasn't easy for Moses to leave the burning bush and go back to the land of Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. It wasn't easy for Daniel to pray in front of the open windows knowing that he would be cast into the lion's den. It wasn't easy for Peter to get out of the boat and start walking on the water to Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't easy for the Apostle Paul to be shipwrecked and imprisoned and be beaten and stoned and left on the right roadside dead. And it wasn't easy for those fishermen to leave their nets in their boat and to forsake everything they had and follow him. And for your life, if you go where God wants you to go, if you do what God wants you to do, it will not be easy, but do it anyway because he is your Lord, he is your master, and you are following him. He'll take you to some difficult places. He will. He'll also take you to some unfamiliar places. Unfamiliar, or I almost use the word uncomfortable places because we love to be comfortable, don't we? We like the familiar places. We like the comfortable. That's the reason you go to the same restaurant and order the same thing every time you go. You notice that? Because it's comfortable. We like to be comfortable. But the call of Jesus upon your life is not to be comfortable. Now, here in America, we're very comfortable with our religion. We're very comfortable with our Christian faith. But Jesus calls you to be uncomfortable. He'll stretch you. He'll get you outside your comfort zone because nobody, nobody grows inside your comfort zone. Only when you begin to stretch outside your comfort zone, you begin to learn more and trust more and grow more. So if God's calling you outside your comfort zone, good! <laughs> That means he's working in your life. Don't be afraid to stretch and lean into that which is unfamiliar, that which is uncomfortable, because that's where your faith in Jesus Christ will take you. And the last thing I'll say is following Jesus and obeying him must, it must also take you to ordinary places. Ordinary places. 
let me explain what I mean. I've had the great joy of having some just mountaintop experiences in my life with the Lord. Back in 1997, I bust all night long with a bunch of people didn't know so I could stand on the nation's mall by the, by the, by, near the Washington Monument to be a part of the uh, promise keepers stand in the gap. Nearly 800,000 men, my closest friends, <laughs> joined. We stood out there. And that day I spent on the nation's mall singing and praying with, with hundreds of thousands of other believers. That was a, a great spiritual moment in my life. A couple years ago, I was on the edge of the Gobi Desert, just north of China. I was visiting some of our missionaries, and we traveled to uh, eastern Mongolia and found this nomadic hut, and we sat down and shared a meal and shared the Christian faith with two Mongolian nomadic shepherds. And right there that afternoon, they prayed to receive Jesus, and that was a high moment to see how the gospel works around the globe. And and I've been in some worship services where you just felt like you're being lifted to heaven, and and the tears would flow, and and the voice would, would, would catch in your throat because it was a high, wonderful, emotional moment. But I've grown most in my Christian faith through the ordinary, regular, mundane, unexceptional things of life. Just day after day, reading the Scriptures, being humble, checking my attitude, being submissive, not getting my way, just day after day after day after day. That is what caused you to grow closer to Jesus. You can't live on a steady diet of these high emotional moments. If you want to grow closer to Jesus, it happens in the ordinary, mundane, regular parts of life. Being a husband who cares for his wife as Christ loved the church. Being an adult son or daughter who honors his mom and dad as they go into the elder years of their life. Being an employee that refuses to steal office supplies and shirk responsibilities that you're being paid for. Being the kind of neighbor that reaches out to children and people near you. Just the unexceptional, ordinary, regular things of life. That's how you grow closer to Jesus. Jesus isn't calling you to live on one mountaintop after another, but just in the ordinary, regular things of life, obey him. Follow him, serve him, honor him. And when you do that, you'll be following Jesus. Now let's pray together. Father, I pray you would show us how each day, even in the ordinary ways, we can follow you. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would help us to determine how we may do that even now. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing our final song, and I and some of our ministers will be standing here at front. And obeying Jesus is really, there's no magical formula. There's no one, two, three secret formula, and poof, it's done. But it's just on the recurring, regular things. And also understand that following and obeying Jesus is done in the moment. Some of y'all might have plans to obey Jesus a month from now, maybe a year from now. But I sense what the Lord wants to know is, what about right now, in this very moment? Not tomorrow, not next week, not even the rest of your life, but in this moment. Is there some way in your life, this moment, where you need to obey Him? It might be confessing a sin that you thought you could keep hidden from the Lord and everybody else. It might be mending a broken relationship with a former business partner or former spouse or maybe your adult son or daughter who's been at odds with you. How do you need to obey him in this moment? In the first service at 8.30, we had a lady come forward, made the commitment of membership because that's how she was going to obey Jesus. Maybe you've never been baptized. And that's a step of faith you want to make, obeying Jesus. 
Or maybe you just want to be a better employee. Now you realize that you really haven't been setting a good example at work. And you realize as a follower of Jesus, you need to do better. In this moment, what will you determine is how you can follow and obey him today. If you want to walk forward to one of us and come and pray, you do that. Come share a commitment with us. We'll pray with you. Maybe let you go back to your seat. But in this moment, may you determine you're going to follow him. Like the song says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's stand together, and as God leads you today, may you come.